concerned about what I see happening in the justice system with hundreds of thousands of young lives being lost to a system uh, that is overly punitive, is motivated by fear and racial bias, it's economically exploitative, and it's a system that makes worse those that it purports to rehabilitate. And in New York City, I've seen our own children, our own babies uh, being literally plucked uh, from their neighborhoods and literally being shipped up the river to rural counties that are economically dependent upon them for their survival. And they're, they're being sent into a system that brutalizes them, that fears them, that doesn't care for them, and profits off of their destruction. And I ask, when are we going to stop this madness? He received his first ticket when he was 10 years old, which w resulted in probation. The second ticket was from school, probation. The third ticket was a broken window, $50 broken window, which gave him a minimum length of stay of nine months in a Texas state correctional facility for juveniles. That nine months turned into three and a half years. Three and a half years. Not only did the system um, rape my son from his right to live, but it did, he didn't have the opportunity to even much be a kid, go to high school, try to go to college, prom. The system took that away from him. And today my son is still in jail, like I said, a victim of that school to prison pipeline. And right now he spends 23 hours a day, every day for the last year and a half, in a cell, away from everyone for a crime that he didn't commit. My husband and I lost our son to the system. He was 17 years old. For my son, it was minutes. He had asked not to be left alone, and he was. And it was enough time to take his life. Each day is one more day that we're risking a child's life. I was hopeless, and it turned me into an animal. I had to leave my humanity at the door in order to survive in the place that I was, that I was put. And it was all, only for a fight. And children do fight. There was no weapons involved. It was just a fight. And the uh, court counsel decided to pick up the charges and pursue it. And they threw me in Spofford. I felt like I was in another planet. And parts of me died that day. But it's okay. Because those parts that died got reborn. I stand before you now is Chino Hardin, the warrior, who will never, ever let this happen to another child as long as it's breath in my body, I swear to you. I will continue to fight for this. It's not every day. It's every second. As you breathe right now, some child is being raped inside a juvenile facility. As you breathe right now, some child is hanging up in a juvenile facility. As we sit right here and talk about these things, People are dying behind our walls. So I encourage everyone to not lobby just today, but to go back home to your own cities and bang them. And let them know that we will not stand for this. And every time you let, lock up a young person, that we'll be right there to shut your system down. In Louisiana, we have the highest incarcerated rate in the world. But brothers and sisters, we can change that. In 1995, there was a youth facility by the name of Tallulah that was deemed the nation's worst youth facility in the country. And because of parents and organizers and people like you all, we were able to close it down. There is some hope. There are some system people that are out there that, you know, have our backs. The chief in San Francisco worked with us and some, some young mothers in creating the Young Incarcerated Mothers' Bill of Rights. And that was after hearing stories of a mom miscarrying in her cell because the guards ignored her. 2008, the Bill of Rights was adopted in San Francisco. Um, when I was in high school, I lived in a mostly white suburb, right? Went to school with mostly white kids. And as part of doing this work in disparities, I was like, I need to take a second and reflect. And so I made a list of all the crimes I had seen my white peers commit in high school and realized it was the first time I had ever thought of those behaviors as illegal or criminal. I was taught it was just being young. 
Most of these people have had an uninterrupted path to college since then, too. This is the other side of disparities. White middle class young people having the privilege of a future protected despite their mistakes, bad decisions, and youthful recklessness. So when we're sitting in these meetings asking these legislators who have perhaps shared a similar background to that to please consider passing this Delinquency Prevention Act and they're thinking about juveniles and delinquents, they don't need to think about all that. They need to think about the mess that they made when they were in high school and how they had the opportunity to make mistakes and grow without being put in a cage to take away their humanness. So I come here as a dreamer, as a visionary, to remember the audacity of the heartbeat, same heartbeat that began us this morning, of the corazones and the hearts and the dreams that are in the houses of slavery and in these dungeons of shame and in, in our communities, here to say to those houses of slavery that we will no longer be compliant with the way these young people are treated in the system. And we're there here to tell those houses that through the reauthorization of the Juvenile Justice Delinquency Prevention Act, it can be done. And we're here to also let them know that we won't forget and that we're going to be here year after year after year after year after year until this thing gets passed. So the earlier they do it, the better for them, right? Because we're going to keep on fighting. Because we're going to keep on remembering the heartbeat, the corazón, the thump, thump of the dreams that are still in those houses of slavery. 